So um, am I the only one here from the VA? Is that my understanding? Okay. Um, and so I thought, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Because I really can't represent the whole VA. I, I can talk, um, I know what I'm doing, but I did, I did want to introduce to you a little bit about the Veterans Health Administration for those who may not be familiar with it. It is the largest integrated delivery system in the US. Um, I think these are numbers from 2009 or 2010, a $36 billion annual budget, most of that for patient care. Um, but about almost 600 million for research. And we provide inpatient and outpatient care for veterans. And in multiple settings, there are 152 hospitals or medical centers. There are many community um, outpatient clinics uh, that are affiliated with all of those uh, medical centers, nursing homes, domiciliaries, um, home-based care, and rehab. Um, with regards to research, we have an Office of Research and Development, and there are four main programs in that office, biomedical and laboratory, clinical science, and cooperative studies. These are clinical trials and large multi-site um, uh, clinical studies. There's a whole uh, research uh, devoted to rehabilitation, and there's health services research and development, which is uh, where I sit. And within that, there's a, a special initiative that's called Query or Quality Enhancement Research Initiative. And this is where most of the implementation uh, science, implementation research is, is um, housed. So this is um, a slide from my colleague, Brian Mittman, who is our implementation scientist at, at my VA. And, um, this is kind of uh, the, the research implementation pipeline at the VA. This is like a unidirectional kind of thing, but there's feedback loops all the time. But um, on your far right, there's that initial basic um, discovery. Uh, and then there's trying to translate that into clinical guidelines uh, with effectiveness studies and then uh, and health services type research studies. And then ev eventually, once those evidence-based guidelines are developed to then conduct implementation research uh, to try and understand why there may be variability in the uptake of these guidelines and how they're practiced. And in the VA, it's kind of neat because we have all these medical centers and every single one of them is very different and yet we're trying to practice uh, very standardized healthcare. So with respect to health services, genomics, this is a relatively new program. Um, and I was um, introduced to it because while, while I was at the RAND Corporation, the VA asked RAND to develop a white paper, a systematic review on the topic of delivery of genetic services for adults so that they could better understand what are some of the gaps to then inform um, priorities for research. And so this is what uh, Pauline Sieverding, who is the project officer for the Health Services Genomics Program, uh, she identified four main areas. Uh, capacity, informatics, education, and then implementation. So these are the four areas, and I think uh, Dr. Sieverding is going to be revamping and, and revising her um, research priorities for the next five years uh, pretty soon. Um, and then so following that, uh, coming up with what the research priorities are, uh, then Dr. Sieverding put out a priority solic solicitation in 2008, um, and this was specifically to centers of excellence in health services research that were already established within the VA system. And I believe at the time there were 15 or so. And so the idea was to have these centers respond um, to do some health services genomics work to encourage innovative research for evidence-based planning of veteran health services in genetics and genomics, and to begin development of tools and models for genomic translation within the VA. So uh, seven centers were funded, and so I'm at the bottom, Greater Los Angeles, but I wanted to share with you that there are other health services implementation researchers within the VA at these different sites. 
um, and they're doing all kinds of interesting work. This is what was proposed back in 2008, and many of them have expanded and gone beyond um, what's listed here. So uh, for the rest of my talk, I wanted to just describe a little bit about what we're doing to give you an idea of perhaps what others are doing um, at the other sites. So um, we are within the Center of Excellence um, at the VA in Sepulveda. And that VA actually, its focus is the, um, the that Center of Excellence, the, the focus is the study of healthcare provider behavior. Um, and I thought that was a pretty good match because much of my interest is in trying to change healthcare provider behavior when it comes to genetics, genomics. Um, and so we have uh, lots of strength in provider behavior theory, quality improvement, implementation science, and then when I showed up, some experience with medical genetics. And so our mission uh, to conduct health services and implementation research that will promote adoption and implementation of effective delivery of evidence-based genetic genomic medicine to improve the health and health care for veterans. And this is our team. Um, this is kind of our core team. Um, I don't want to go over everybody's name and what their role is, but basically um, it, it was wonderful for me because I just kind of showed up and I was able to work with this group of people who have done health services and implementation research in other areas like HIV and women's health, and um, this was just one more thing for them to help tackle. So um, we have uh, so far five uh, funded projects. The first was that genomics pilot from um, the VA uh, HSRD office that kind of just got us started. Uh, there were several uh, pilots that we did. We um, tried to understand what was being done at our facility in terms of genetic testing, family history, um, and we also had an expert panel help inform our research agenda. Education was a big thing that was uh, mentioned over and over, uh, and so I was lucky to um, apply for some funding from CDC, um, and the focus there was family history uh, with regards to hereditary cancer syndromes, and I'll be talking more specifically about this project. Um, the, the third project listed is actually a national survey. Uh, we're surveying chiefs of staff of all of the medical centers and chiefs of, um, if I can remember, pathology, oncology, neurology, and cardiology, uh, and I think there's another one, but I can't recall, um, at the 152 medical centers, just trying to get a sense of what they're doing with respect to genetics, genomics, um, what kind of arrangements they may have to provide services and testing. Um, the fourth project is another education project funded by CDC, uh, and here we are developing strategies to improve, hopefully improve, uh, implementation of genetic test requesting and also um, providing a consultative report back to providers for uh, certain molecular genetic tests that are being ordered uh, via our electronic health record. And then the last one is um, a, a relatively small project. Um, Dr. Larry Meyer, who is the lead of the National Genomic Medicine Program, would like to roll out Lynch syndrome screening across the country. And in my vision, which is Veterans Integrated Service Network 22, um, it's Southern California and Southern Nevada. We have five medical centers. And so I went and I, we're basically interviewing chiefs there to find out what are the potential barriers, what might help facilitate. Uh, and, and, and how should we develop an implementation plan to get this done? So um, for the remainder of my time, which I know I don't have much, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Family History Project from CDC because this is the project that's most furthest along. So the goal, um, again, was to develop a multi-component education program to improve recognition and referral of patients at risk for hereditary cancer. And so essentially we wanted to try and implement guidelines or recommendations from USPSTF, NCCN, and CDC um, regarding hereditary cancer uh, with respect to family history. And this is our uh, logic model, so uh, have a population and try and have these educational strategies to improve family history documentation, referral for genetic consultation, uh, utilization of preventive services, and then ultimately 
hopefully, morbidity and mortality. Um, and with this particular project, the first year was devoted mostly to just developing our implementation strategies, um, our education program. And so the outcomes that we uh, proposed to assess were really the family history documentation and the referral for genetic consultation. And so I, I said multi-component because if all we did was give didactic lectures, that wouldn't do anything. So, um, but we did, we gave didactic lectures, but also developed other informational interventions uh, and clinical interventions, mostly uh, tools in our electronic health record and behavioral interventions where we gave feedback to clinicians about um, their performance. And uh, this is just a, a picture to show you. Um, so. We, we did a seven-part uh, CME approved lecture series. We have a website that we call GCAT that has a bunch of information on it. We had uh, patient information sheets about family history and what to expect from a genetic consultation. Um, we had um, in the clinic a paper uh, administered uh, family history questionnaire that the front office staff were supposed to give to patients to fill out before they saw their provider and then their provider would go through a clinical reminder to capture family history information. Um, in that reminder, there's a, a document that's kind of the red flags to remind them about indication for referral. And then right over here, that's basically our quarterly report back to the providers to let them know, well, this is how often you're completing the reminder compared to your peers. This is how often you're referring a patient for genetics compared to your peers. Um, so we first set out trying to maybe develop a tool in the electronic health record that would help identify red flags, and we talked about that yesterday. Um, and what we heard in focus group feedback from our primary care clinicians is this is totally not useful. Uh, we need to document complete family history, and then once the family history is documented, we'll be able to figure out who we should refer. Well, I already knew that that was unlikely because they hadn't made any referrals, they hadn't ordered any genetic tests in five years. So it was like, okay, whatever. Um, but I had to listen to them because um, this, the one that we created wasn't gonna work. And they wanted a, a tool that would be very quick that most of the time the answer would be no. So, <laughs> So we did, we built that tool, I think. Um, and I'm sorry for these screenshots. This is what our electronic health record looks like right now. It's not very pretty. It's kind of gray on gray, but um, the providers are very used to these. So this is a reminder. It sits in a reminder drawer and primary care clinicians are very accustomed to going in there and completing reminders when they're due. It's non-mandatory. Um, but basically it just explains on the front sheet, you know, what this reminder is all about to help them document family history and make referral. Um, the patient can decline to provide family history at that visit, um, or if the patient has limited life expectancy, then they can opt out. So um, it's about eight questions. And the first one, well first you have to decide if it's a female or a male, uh, and then are you adopted? Um, if yes, they, they're supposed to try to provide information about biological family members. And then two questions, have you ever been diagnosed with any kind of cancer, and have you ever had 10 or more colon polyps? So yes, no, don't know. Uh, were any first degree relatives uh, ever affected with cancer? Any second degree maternal relatives? Any second degree paternal relatives? Any other relatives? Um, and then this, this window is, if you had clicked yes, then it would open up and say, okay, which first degree relative, for example, mother, father, brother, sister. If you click on here at sister, then which cancer, and if you click on which cancer, what's the age at onset? And we just use 50 as a threshold. And then to get out of this reminder, um, they have to make a decision about whether or not they wanna refer this patient for a genetic consult. And so they can, they can request the consult, or they can say, well, the consult's indicated, but the patient is declining. Or they can say it's not indicated. And at the bottom, there are some links to the NCCN guidelines and USPSTF, et cetera. And again, there's that indications for cancer genetic consultation. They can click into that if they've forgotten. Okay, so um, we are just finished now with implementation. We finished in September. So um, basically, we had some pre-implementation data. We're probably gonna have to go back a little bit more in time on that. 
Um, and we've been monitoring these health factors that are generated by this tool. So every click of the tool generates data that we can query in Vista, which is the backbone to our EHR. Um, and then we've also been uh, abstracting information from 10% of randomly selected charts each month. Um, and we did a, a pre-post knowledge and attitude survey and also some interviews with these, the clinicians involved. Oh, and I should have said this was implemented in our women's clinics only. So there were only nine providers in those clinics and seven were actively involved in this project. So it's a, it's a relatively small project pilot. So in the 18 months of implementation, there were just over 4,700 uh, family history reminders due, so 4,700 patients. Um, and it was completed for 27% of them. And then uh, by looking at those health factors, I, I assigned a strong, moderate, or weak familial risk for cancer based on kind of standard guidelines. Um, and you'll see 13% had a strong familial risk, 27% moderate, et cetera. And about two-thirds of the strong were referred, almost 20% of moderate familial risk, and a few of the weak familial risks were referred for consult. And um, so in that chart abstraction, we saw that before we implemented our tool, 30% of the charts had some family history in it, although it wasn't that great. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. And then post-implementation in orange, you'll see that um, with the template, uh, we increased documentation of family history, but still some providers were using just documenting in text, that's in green. Um, and then over time, you'll see that documentation kind of almost decreased over time um, at the, at, from that progress note. But in looking back, the family history had been completed previously. So about half of the charts overall. And this is data through June, so we still need to keep looking at this. And the type of family history that was recorded, so before implementation, um, there was some mention of family history in first degree relatives, of course, 76% of the charts. Second degree relatives, 48%, as you can see. But so what we saw was an increase in that in the post-implementation phase. Um, and then uh, the lineage of the relatives, so were they second degree, uh, and if they were maternal or paternal, that increased substantially. The age of cancer onset increased substantially, uh, and Jewish ancestry. So these were all things that allowed the clinicians, I believe, to do a better job of risk assessment. And then the knowledge and attitudes, and I'll finish up quickly. Um, we looked pre and post at the knowledge which is kind of in the middle, those two. And I just did this slide last night, so I apologize if it's not too clear. Uh, and then we asked um, a bunch of questions about their attitudes of how relevant genetics was to their practice. And we had um, about 42 questions on this survey, and, and we've broken them out into domains. Uh, and basically, you can see um, at the bottom of the slide, they had 59% correct score pre-implementation, and that went up to 73%. So they did learn, um, and they learned, actually, look at genetic testing um, topics. They went from a knowledge of correct percent of 33 up to 71. So they actually learned quite a bit over this whole process about management and referral and ethical issues, et cetera. Um, but the relevance to their practice didn't change at all. If anything, it was even less. Um, so I think it's because, um, well, I can tell you in a, in a bit, but maybe this, this next quote might summarize it. So this is one provider, and this is similar to the interviews we have with the others. So she said, I've gained in so many ways by participating. I've refreshed and expanded my knowledge about genetics. I've gained substantial new knowledge about hereditary cancers. As a result, I now feel quite confident in recognizing red flag patterns. Um, I don't necessarily identify which syndrome a patient may have, but I can ascertain whether further evaluation is needed, can understand what the results of tests mean, and understand my obligation to follow through. So I think because I was there and our inter the anthropologists interviewing these providers learned that they just were happy that I was there to make a referral when they saw these patients, but they didn't want to take on the job of testing, et cetera, for, their, for themselves. Um, so basically, now that we're done, our anthropologist asked, well, do you want this reminder? What, what aspects of the program do you want to continue? They want the reminder. They think it was most influential in improving their, um, the, their performance around family history. And they want it to stay in our electronic record, but they don't want it mandatory. Um, and they all value the, the consult service. If it wasn't there, they probably wouldn't want to be asking these questions. 
because um, they wouldn't necessarily know what to do or have the time to deal with it. Um, and they all wanted me to continue to review those reminder, um, the, the health factors generated to help them identify patients who would be appropriate ref for referral in case they didn't pick those up. They wanted more lectures. Um, some, some wanted to continue with the family history questionnaire in the clinic, and very few used the website. And so just next steps, um, I mentioned that we were only, with this project, able to look at family history documentation and consultation. So um, we are now planning with VA funding to look at uh, utilization of preventive services uh, by women for whom the reminder was completed, those who were referred and not referred to genetics. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. And that's it. Thanks. Sorry I went over a little bit. Any questions? I think we have time for just a question or two. Go. Problem when they do identify somebody who has uh, has hereditary disease because referring them out of the VA and then trying to deal with it um, is becomes pretty complicated. So are they planning to increase genetic services? Yeah. Um, so right now, so our, our national survey is going to tell us a lot more about what arrangements exist and what which facilities actually have genetics providers because I've even learned myself. Boston, San Antonio, Houston, Seattle, Los Angeles, there are sites that have geneticists um, and counselors. Uh, but um, yeah, you're right, that, that's just a handful of 152. So um, the national program is doing something interesting. That, that program started about a year ago. And um, they're hiring counselors to provide a telemedicine um, consultation uh, two sites, so that's one model that should increase accessibility. Um, the other is um, there are arrangements, and so really any veteran who needs genetic services, they just have to do fee basis care um, and make a request, and it has to be reviewed, and hopefully the people reviewing it understand the request. And most importantly, the request needs to indicate how it's going to change their make help make diagnosis, change management, etc. So it's not like you can't get it, it's just people have to go the fee basis route to, to get this arranged for their patients. So Marin, hi, Gail Jarvik. Hi. Um, so just an update on Seattle, which is that the VA doesn't plan on replacing Tom Bird when he retires this year, so we'll I have know. no geneticist. We're going in the wrong direction. But I mean, what you're finding is you have to drum up the genetics consults, the docs aren't finding them on their own. And that's the real concern about just waiting for referrals because they are right. not appropriately referring patients. Well, I would say, you know, we conducted a bunch of interviews with chiefs, you know, to inform our web-based survey and the neurologists, the oncologists. So the specialists, they know, and they, half of my referrals are coming from specialists to help make a diagnosis of a genetic disorder. You know, these referrals from primary care are mostly patients at risk with family history, et cetera. Um, but I, I think that it's just a combination of both. And frankly, I don't think our providers are any different from people out in the community. Um, and so, yeah, the neurologists know when they think they have a case and they need genetic testing and whether or not they need the counseling, et cetera, to go along with it. So at my facility, the minute they knew I was there, I started getting a lot of consults. Right, but before you were there, you spent right. five years with no consults. Well, and I, think I think that's what I worry about, that without that presence, without that, thinking But that was from it. primary care. So I honestly don't know what oncology and neurology was doing before I arrived. I, I would have to go and look into that. Right. I, I think it, you know, my own opinion is that I would really like to see the VA continue that service, because I believe having someone embedded increases education and increases referrals, but there's something you can study. Well, hopefully, and, and I think this type of research is, the VA loves health services research, um, it thrives on it, and if we can provide good feedback to the powers that be, then, then things can happen. Well, good okay, one. I think yeah. we need to move on. We're gonna try to squeeze in um, uh, Bill and Les for five minutes here to talk about the NIH Clinical Center 